This video goes with section 70 of Hanson and Quinn's Greek, an intensive course, and covers the circumstantial use of the participle. You'll find that on pages 214 to 216 of Hanson and Quinn. So we've already talked about in the video for section 69 the attributive use of the participle, where a participle is in attributive position and it tells you more about the noun that it's in attributive position to. We also talked about how the attributive use um, can give you nice substantives of people and things doing whatever the verbal action is in the participle. But now, keeping the idea that these are verbal adjectives, so they're still going to have to agree in case, number, and gender with something in the sentence, Greek participles can also be in predicate position, not in attributive position, and tell us the circumstances of the sentence, more about what's going on, not just limiting or describing a particular noun. So here, Arhusa he Helene, ton poietain thusanta pethe, you can see that Arhusa and thusanta are not in attributive position. They agree, Arhusa, feminine nominative singular, with he Helene, feminine nominative singular, and thusanta, masculine accusative singular, with poietain, but they are not in attributive position, and so they're going to be doing something other than giving us more attributes, more information about the particulars of Helen or the poet. You could translate this, ruling, Helen persuades the poet, having sacrificed. But that's pretty compressed, and English is probably going to want to say more, depending on the context. And most of what this video is going to do is tell you all the possibilities for what a circumstantial participle can be telling you, depending on the context. So this same sentence, this same arhusa, the participle at the beginning, could mean ruling, while ruling, Helen persuades, although ruling, Helen persuades, since she is ruling, Helen persuades, or even if she is ruling, Helen persuades. And thusanta, modifying the poet, can mean having sacrificed, the default way that we translated it to start with, or perhaps after sacrificing, or although sacrificing, because he sacrificed, or even if he sacrificed. Greek can express any of those things with the sentence that you see there. So with circumstantial participles, if they're not in attributive position, for instance, this one, Luthentes tois theois ethusamen, look at the ending of the participle and see what it agrees with in the sentence. Because remember, Whatever it agrees with is, so to speak, the subject of that participle. It's the thing doing the participle or the people doing the participle. So here, luthentes, masculine nominative plural, has to agree with the plural subject of this sentence, whatever that subject is. Here, it's only expressed in the verb, so you could say that it agrees with the men in ethusamen. So we are doing this participle freed, we sacrificed to the gods. And that is the default way to translate this, which is usually a good bet to start with. And my recommendation to you is that when you are reading participles, start with the default and perhaps clunky translation of the participle, where you keep it as much as possible as a participle in English, so that you understand really clearly who's doing what, what agrees with what, in a sentence and then elaborate on it to make the best idiom for your context. So start with the default. And that's what I did with our Helen and the poet sentence. And then I showed you all the different ways that you could translate those two circumstantial participles in, depending on the context. So let's talk about all of those different possibilities. The first one is the temporal circumstance. When you understand a participle this way, 
it's telling you something about when the rest of the sentence is happening. Now, the relationship between Luthentas and the rest of the sentence here could easily be temporal without anything else. After we were freed, we sacrificed to the gods. That would be just fine without any other hints. But sometimes Greek will give you an extra word that points you in the direction of this interpretation of the participle. For instance, epeta. Luthentes epeta tois theois ethusamen. Freed, we then sacrificed to the gods. So that extra word is going to tell you, do translate this as a temporal circumstance. After being freed, we then sacrificed to the gods is another perfectly good translation. I like to see the participles stay the participles if English usage will allow it, but that won't always be the case. You can also turn it into a whole clause. After we were freed, we then sacrificed to the gods. If you need to make this negative, the negative you will use is u. The next kind of circumstance I want to talk about is concessive. Luthentes tois theois ethusamen. Freed, even though that's the case, we're conceding that case, we sacrifice to the gods. And without any other words, that's what this sentence could mean. Concessive is one of your choices with circumstantial participles. But sometimes, again, you will get an extra word in Greek that points you to this particular kind of circumstance. So if you see homos, luthentes, homos, tois theois ethusamen, then you really should choose the concessive meaning. Freed, we nevertheless sacrificed to the gods. Or perhaps, although freed, we nevertheless sacrificed to the gods. A little awkward in English, but you could still do it that participle way in English. Often, a whole clause is the better idiom in English. So, although we were freed, we nevertheless sacrificed to the gods. Makes really good sense of luthentes, homos, tois theois, ethusamen. So, homos is an adverb that is directly modifying the verb in the main clause. You could also see kaiper as a modifier of the participle. Kaiper luthentes, tois theois, ethusamen means, although we were freed, we sacrificed to the gods. Either kaiper or homos will point you to the concessive circumstance. That would be the choice you would make among the possibilities if you see either of those words. If this happens to need to be negative, the negative you will use is u with the participle. Circumstantial participles can also be causal. Luthentes tois theois ethusamen, the being freed could be the cause, the reason why we sacrifice to the gods. Now in Greek, you're going to get pretty often words that point you in that direction. Hata and hoya are both new vocabulary words in Unit 8 that are markers that point you towards the causal circumstance that a participle is expressing. If you see those, even though they don't themselves mean since, that's a pretty good way to translate them. Since we were freed, we sacrificed to the gods. And this is the one kind of circumstantial participle that I recommend that you go straight to an English clause instead of keeping it an English participle. Because it just doesn't make sense to say since freed or since being freed. It doesn't really work. So um, if you see hata or hoya, say, since, and whatever the participle is. Now, those two particles have an extra subtlety, which is that whoever is saying or writing the sentence with this causal participle in it is pretty sure about, is vouching for whatever the reason that is stated in the participle. This is what the author really thinks is true. If you use instead a host, it can still be the causal interpretation of the circumstances, but the author isn't vouching for that reason. This is what somebody told them, and they're reporting that, but they're not claiming it. It's what somebody else claims. Hos luthentes tois theois ethusamen still means since we were freed, we sacrificed to the gods. But here, the host can lay a little bit of doubt on the 
um, the reason, or at least that we shouldn't uh, hold the author or the speaker responsible for that reason. Now, I got to say, it's nice to know these things, but it doesn't change your translations very much. It could, in certain uh, texts that you might read in real Greek, give a better sense of the author's stance on some issue. But most of the time, what you need to do is remember that each of these can be translated as since we were freed or whatever the participle is and go on from there. But I didn't want to leave out this extra subtlety that these particles can give you. So with hata or hoya, you know that it's a causal participle. Host can do causal participles as well. And if any of those is negative, it would be with an u. Now, there's another use of the participle, which is for purpose. And then you're going to have future participle to indicate purpose. It's just like a purpose clause. So instead of hina, host, or hapos, and the subjunctive or the optative, you can use simply a future participle. So, host thou santes tois the ois epemphthesan means intending to sacrifice to the gods they were sent. Now, you see here another use of host and a circumstantial participle. But notice when it's doing purpose instead of unvouched for cause, when it's doing purpose, it's with a future participle. And that's what you're going to find. You could also translate this as they were sent to sacrifice to the gods using probably better English idiom to express that purpose. Now, host with the future participle is definitely going to do purpose, but really all you need is the future participle itself. It doesn't have to have host with it. In fact, often doesn't have host with it. So thuson tes, tois the ois epemthesan, still means they were sent to sacrifice to the gods. Sometimes the intending version works really well, and it's nice because it keeps the participle structure in English. Arxusa he Helene ton poetain pethe, intending to rule, Helen persuades the poet. Here the negative is u, as in the other circumstances that you've seen so far. Let's look at the conditional circumstance. Circumstantial participles can actually take the place of the if clause of a conditional sentence. A participle can be a whole protasis. So our sentence, Luthentes tois the ois ethusamen, can mean if we were freed, we sacrificed to the gods. And it's as if this were a past general conditional sentence. There are no special extra words that might point you in the direction of the conditional possibility. Although sometimes the shape of the clause that it goes with, that is to say all of those apotesis things, the plus, optative, and on, and all of the things that you learned when you learned conditional sentences, that might clue you in that you should add an if to the participle. But the only thing that can tell you that it's definitely a conditional use of the participle, except context, is if it happens to be negative. Because for this one, the negative is may. And it's the only circumstantial participle that has may. So if it's negative, you know for sure that you are looking at a conditional circumstance. And that's pretty nice. You can see that if it's negative. So me luthentes tois the ois ethusamen has to be if we were not freed, we sacrificed to the gods. It can't be any of the other possibilities that I've given you through the course of this video. So, once you determine that you're looking at a participle that's not attributive, I recommend start with the default translation. Freed, we sacrificed to the gods. But then remember all of the things that it can do and think about your context. So perhaps this is a temporal participle. After being freed, we sacrifice to the gods. Or perhaps it's concessive. Although freed, we sacrifice to the gods. Perhaps it's causal. Since we were freed, we sacrifice to the gods. Or maybe it's conditional. If we were freed, we sacrifice to the gods. And if it happens to be negative, you know for sure 
that it's conditional. With all the other circumstances, you're going to have ooh as a negative. And you may have other words in a sentence that points you towards one of these choices. So if you have a may, you know that you've got a conditional one. And we went over some of the different words, hoya, hata, epeta, kaiper, homos, that might point you towards some of these other circumstances quite specifically. If you have a future participle, you know for sure that you're looking at purpose. So intending to sacrifice to the gods, they were sent. And there, the negative is may. So that's actually a fairly brief overview of the different ways that you can use a participle to tell you the circumstances of a sentence. You will practice recognizing those things and reading those things. And as you read more Greek in Hanson and Quinn and in the wild, you'll get used to seeing participles this way.